Operation Barbarossa Operation Barbarossa was the code name for the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany and some of its Axis allies. During World War II. It started on June 22, 1941. It was the largest military invasion in human history, with more than 3 million men attacking along an 1800-mile front. The code name was a tribute to Frederick I. A German king and Holy Roman Emperor who had led a crusade to the East in the 12th century. But the question of how India was perceived by the Germans and the Japanese and their lack of coordination strategically. Because obviously to take and seize India and threaten it was something the Allies certainly perceived when you look at how the, if you read how the Imperial General Staff and the Americans are thinking about Asia, they are very concerned, especially in 1942, about the possibility of a linkage between the Japanese and the Germans. So uh, so these are all interesting questions to get a, a fresher perspective of. And uh, I have feelers out to friends of mine in different graduate schools are any of you guys knowing people working on this subject or who would you suggest that might be good and the problem is that you know this is a generational gap issue because uh, all of us had as professors people who were directly involved in the war uh, and that is no longer the case uh, that yeah. generation is gone uh, and uh, the people who are the sort point. of work, the, carried the work of them they're gone. I remember having a discussion with uh, uh, Harold Deutsch uh, when he was in charge of a, essentially a, se a Second World War roundtable out there. Uh, and he was and I very much had a uh, remember the conversation was during the 50th anniversary of the Second World War. Because he Deutsch, if you remember, did a book on the uh, Beer Hall Putsch. Uh, that was his dissertation. And they still have, I believe, out where he taught a, a seminar in his honor. And, you know, and, and you can see that there was a change going on because uh, given the impact of the 60s on the academy, there just was less and less interest in these subjects. And so and I know that there is an interest in there. Don't get me wrong, but we just have to be creative and figure out who to get to join us to talk about this. So, yes, that issue of Asia is essential to get a better clarif clarifying opinion about uh, other questions. Uh, Jim, I just want to tell you, I, I sent that. Uh, uh, reference for the Smolensk Hillgruber article on Smolensk. I sent that to you. Okay, very good. So you, uh, have, you have that. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Now, one thing I'd like to ask um, uh, DZ to do is just stop the sharing right now so I can, I want to show something to you guys. Unfortunately, Craig, you can't still see the picture. Is that correct? Uh, I can, I, I might be able to. I, I, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, All right. Well, what I was yes. what to do is I wanted to show this is a uh, part of the log off maps. Can you see that, Craig? Uh, yeah, I know. I know what it is. I'm trying to I have you're in a little box in my upper right hand corner. I'm trying to maximize it. The, the rest of us, I think, are seeing it. OK, Jim. Yeah, that's probably where I should be. I should be always in a little box. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as you can see, um, now this is a rather good pixelation. The Library of Congress has essentially all the log OS maps that we're going to need to explore in depth the campaign on the Eastern Front up to December of 1941. Yeah, I got it now. And this is a map uh, of the 21st of June, 1941. And so I was wondering, uh, and again, when we get David in here, uh, you know, forget about it. He's going to go to town on this stuff because we haven't really, you know, like David, when, for example, if you get into here's the deployment of the third Panzer group uh, over here on the on that wing of Army Group Center. Here's the fourth, uh, the second Panzer group down here. And David has uh, maps that go into regimental detail about the flow of fighting hour by hour, June 22nd, June 23rd, June 24th. But I was wondering, uh, Craig, 
uh, since I have this little picture here and you can actually see it, yeah. Uh, what sort of comments do you want to make? Because I can go up and down the front here. I have it blown up to 400%. In fact, let me even have it even cooler. Huh. Oh, no, I Whoa. fucked it up. I fucked it up. Okay, hold my, on. My eyes aren't that good, Jim. <laughs> no, <I'm... laughs> All right, I have to. Uh, I I thought I thought I was going to do something that obviously I didn't do. For some reason, I'm not able to blow the damn thing up again. Oh, that's is that Finland or California? I'm looking at there. No, that I guess that's out there at Tepachi. Uh, <laughs> where the hell? Where, where is it? You live Tepachi? Tehachapi. Tehachapi. The land of the four seasons. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go to these maps. This this is actually the source of the Library of Congress. So I'm going to go back to the uh, this is the atlas itself, just to let you guys know. So this is this is not the day we're going to have fun with. This is further into the campaign. But let me go back to the uh, earlier map here, uh, which is so this way we can actually play with the the map that I was going to manipulate here. Oh, that's not the map. Uh, let's see. But this is where you can find these maps. These are quite amazing. This uh, very detailed. Here we go. Okay, so here's the map for the um, the twenty for twenty uh, first of June, and I'm going to go up and blow it up a little bit here. Oh yeah, I can blow it up tremendously. Yeah. Whoa! Guys. <laughs> yeah. All the Finnish lakes. We got them all. Yeah. Up, 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 up. Oh, yeah. This yeah. This gets a little uncontrollable the way these things go here because uh, yeah, they have the hype. There's Army Group North. Okay, so and that's Army Group North blown up beyond one's wildest dreams there. <laughs> so wondering if we go along the deployment of forces in Army Group North, if you want to make some comments, I want to just share something. Uh, I did indeed. Uh, one of the things that I I got from what listening to Glance talk about this in depth over the years was one of the points he make, makes about the deployment of the Panzertruppen, which, um, you know, here we have the 1st Panzer Division, the 8th Panzer Division. At the points where they're concentrated to break through the Soviet lines, uh, they are numerically, and in terms of firepower, attacking at often 10 to 20 to 1 odds against the Soviets. So when you actually see how they break through, it's no surprise. And we're not even in, we're not even uh, factoring in issues of morale, training, leadership, uh, et cetera. I'm talking materially at the breakthrough points. They have overwhelming superiority, the Germans do, along the front here. But I was wondering, Craig, if you could comment about, let's start with Army Group North. Okay. Um, well, um, yeah, I'll just try to try to not, not get too much down in the weeds here, but of course it was commanded by uh, Ritter von Lieb and a field marshal, and uh, the, the, all, 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 all three field marshals that commanded the three army groups were right around 60 years of age or so, and uh, I think he was 60, 61. Uh, he had a total of uh, <clears throat> 29 divisions, and I, in my book, uh, in my book, Barbarossa Unleashed, the, the big massive tome that I published in 2014, actually made a mistake there. I said that they had 26 divisions. That is because I left off the three uh, division or security divisions, you know, for rear area security. And the reason I did that is because I was using as a source the, the official... German, uh, what do they call it? A uh, 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 schematische Kriegsgliederung, the schematic organization of battle, where they had everything laid out down to individual artillery battalions that were attached to different armies. And they went army by army. And whoever the officer or officers were who put this together, they left off the three uh, security divisions for Army Group North. And I remember thinking to myself, well, that's a little odd. Army Group South has three. Army Group Center has three. Why didn't I, why doesn't Army Group North have three? Now, normally, if this were a secondary source, I would have immediately gone and checked somewhere else, 
like, for example, the order of battle that David Glantz has in his, his book on Barbarossa. And I would have seen right there, oh yes, there were three um, security divisions as well. So that's kind of a, you think you're using the, the best possible source imaginable and some fricking German general st staff officer got it wrong. Um, but anyway, they attacked along about a 300 kilometer front and you are correct. Um, they, all along the front, the Germans were able to establish overwhelming uh, numerical tactical superiority at their points of um, points of penetration, but but that's hardly surprising. I mean, that's what any army that's that's launching an attack is 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 going to uh, try to do. What well, one of the interesting th things is um, the Air Force. Uh, under Lohr, L-O-H-R, I think it was, it was the first, uh, um, uh, the, the first Air Force, um, Luftflotte 1, only had about 400 aircraft or so. It, 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 it didn't have, it, it, it wasn't, wasn't very large. And uh, Hopner, Hopner, who commanded the Panzer Group, of course, he too, would later uh, end up on a meat hook at Plotzenzi prison after the uh, July 20 plot. Uh, he only had 600, 615 tanks uh, among his uh, two Panzer Corps and three Panzer divisions. And um, some, I was just re-familiarizing myself with this the other day, some 40% of his tanks were Czech they were either uh, uh, the, the, the Czech uh, 35T, I think those were, they didn't have many of those. I think they were all outfitted one division. I don't remember if which pan, if it was the seventh panzer or what panzer division it was. And, and 38T, they made up about 40% of the German tanks. Now those, the Czechs produced a lot of good equipment as I'm sure many of you know, but, uh, uh, while those tanks were, were, were quite reliable mechanically, they only had a, a, a 37 millimeter gun. So uh, they weren't gonna do anything against uh, uh, heavier um, Soviet tanks. But uh, in, in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that, that the terrain leading up from, from that border area, uh, uh, that the frontier, uh, toward uh, Leningrad and through the Baltic companies, uh, a, a lot of it was very difficult terrain for tanks, particularly um, on the, the eastern side of, um, of that front, but they still managed to advance very quickly. In fact, uh, von Manstein's 56th Panzer Corps, which only had one Panzer Division, the 8th Panzer Division, I believe it was commanded by a very competent general. I think his name was Brandenburg. He literally had to advance um, uh, 75, 80 kilometers as the crow fly, flies on the first day of the campaign to capture a viaduct over the, I don't even know how you pronounce it, the WC River, whatever, however you pronounce that, uh, because if if the so if the Red Army was able to blow that viaduct, the Germans would be stalled for days in that sector, and and apparently that's what had happened to them in World War One. And hmm. one of the lessons learned was that they had to prevent that from uh, from happening in um, uh, you know in, in in Barbarossa. And and just as an aside. Uh, the, the, the Einsatzgruppe in that region, which I think was Einsatzgruppe A, it actually got to work, so to speak, on the, the second day, not the day of the invasion, but on the, uh, on the 23rd of, uh, of, of uh, June, which is kind of interesting because one of the reviews, a, a reviewer who reviewed that book of mine, First Day on the Eastern Front, which if I'm kind of proud to say, won a, a, a little award from a 
major aggregator and book reviewer of World War II books as one of the six best books on World War II and two, that came out in 2018. He wrote a nice review. And then at the end, he said, but he doesn't talk about the Einsatzgruppen. So it's a whitewash. Don't buy the book. That's, that's what he wrote. The only problem with it was the he Einsatzgruppen, did. which I did mention in the opening chapters, what their mission was. They weren't in action on the 22nd of June. If I had written a book about the second day on the Eastern Front and hadn't mentioned them, then maybe he would have been on to something. So I had, it was a long, complicated process. Choice Magazine is really, really important. Any of you who know it, it goes out to, thou it's a library journal. It goes out to thousands of libraries and says, either buy this book or don't buy this book. And so this was sent out to thousands of libraries. Don't buy this book because it's a whitewash. So I was able to I actually contacted the professor who wrote the article. And of course, he wasn't a military historian. He was a Holocaust historian. And I contacted um, Choice Magazine. And I was eventually able to put in a, they let me put in a retraction or a rebuttal. But but as, as Mark Twain said, what was it he said? Um, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth even has its boots on. And so that was the problem I had to deal with. Yeah, understand. Uh, that's where you'll go into these discussions where, uh, understandably, uh, people will emphasize Holocaust history and don't know anything about operational history. And uh, I was so used to people just talking about operational history for years and never mentioning Holocaust history. So that to me is where we can hopefully have a good synthesis in what we do. Uh, what are your comments about Army Group Center? Well, <clears throat> Army Group Center consisted precisely of 50 and a half divisions. It was by far the largest of the three Army Groups. And of course, the, 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 the focus, the Schwerpunkt of, of the German attack, at least initially, was along the front of Army Group Center. Because on both flanks, the front ran for about 500 kilometers. Uh, most of it along the Bug River, although in the sector of uh, Strauss's 9th Army and Hoth's Three Panzer Group on the left wing, they did not have a river to cross, so they had a number of, of, of thick forests and really bad roads to um, deal with. But um, the two army groups, Hoth and Guderians, uh, collectively had a total of almost 1,900 tanks. Now, keep in mind, the Germans only had 3,200 tanks to begin with, so well over half the armor was concentrated on the front of Army Group Center, as well as one, uh, what was, what was I think, 1,300,000 men, and uh, to be exact, I think something like uh, uh, 7,614 guns, uh, 75 kilometer and uh, and above. And if you look at that map, one thing should just jump right out at you. And that's that huge salient right in the middle of Army Group Center, centered on the, the, the uh, Eastern Polish town of Belostok, okay? And yeah. leading toward Minsk. Uh, so you can see from that and on both shoulders of that salient, the Germans had concentrated their mechanized forces, the two panzer groups. So you can see that the Russians were already halfway encircled on the central front, or most of it, before the uh, the campaign even began. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just sort of highlighting yeah, the yeah. deployment of the second and the other Panzer group and there. Look at this concentration of Panzers there. I'm just thinking, of, you know, all the war games, all of the East Front war games. One of the biggest problems is, and not just based on this map, looking at this and thinking, thinking about it, is that the significant the stacking rules don't apply. You couldn't pile enough pile troops on the spots that are that are indicated in this map, uh, uh. To, and the, based on the rules. It's one of the reasons the Germans do so badly in most of the, most of those. I'm thinking of Griffnock to Meltmark and war in war in war in the East, and quite a few, and of course not, not talking about the simple games, but the more complicated ones. Uh, very interesting. 
Yeah, stacking All rules. Right. Are and what do you have to say about Army Group South, where we get into questions of the Allies with Romania, mm -hmm. and of course later Hungary, Hungary, uh, and uh, the Italian Army. Sure. Comes, Italians, and here you have, actually, if I start here, here's of course Odessa. Yeah. Right. And, um, and well, well, we go. Do. I'll go up farther, uh, and I'll tell you when to stop. Okay, stop right there. Uh, now go down just a little bit. Um, that that's that's pretty good. Um, Army Group South, of course, was commanded by the dean of the of the German officer corps, someone that Hitler was very very careful to treat with the utmost respect. You know, Feldmarschall Gerd von Rundstedt. He had a total of forty one divisions and just under a million men. <clears throat> the vast majority. Let me see, what was it? The, uh, uh, of course, Kleist's first panzer group, which consisted of, had about 715 tanks and five panzer divisions, and they were all equipped with German armor, okay? Mostly panzer groups three and uh, panzer threes, panzer fours, and a small number of panzer ones and twos, which were basically used at that point for reconnaissance or as command tanks or what have you now he part of his front was also along the bug river and part of it was not along a uh along a, a river line now he did face the largest concentration of soviet troops the you know the the the, the kiev special military district which became the southwestern front upon the beginning of Barbarossa. And that was because Stalin was convinced that Hitler was going to launch his main attack toward Ukraine, or if, if and, 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 and when they did, he planned to immediately strike back from, from that sector, instead of trying to, in other words, instead of having the bulk of his Red Army farther north, advancing, say, into East Prussia, where the Germans had lots of fortifications and there were lots of lakes and rivers and things to deal with. He was going to advance up into Galicia, I guess, toward Warsaw and the coast, you know, cut off the German forces. So that was another reason he had, uh, was so strong in the um, Ukraine. In fact, as I think I mentioned, eight of the 20 mechanized corps that were in the Western military districts were in uh, the Southern or in the Kiev military district. And there was some of the biggest, I think the biggest panzer schlacht or tank battle in human history developed in the opening weeks of the campaign when Kleist attacked from the left flank heading toward um, Zitomir with the goal of eventually trapping um, Russian forces uh, 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 west of the Dnieper River, uh, the, the, the Kirponos and his, and his uh, uh, Red Army troops in the south were, were just, they were better prepared for the German attack. And he had spent a lot of time building up massive fortifications along the frontier and what the Germans, uh, what the Russians called fortified, fortified regions. So interestingly enough, none of the German tank forces got into action on the 22nd of June. What they decided to do was, first of all, they needed to break through with these, um, with their infantry and their, their, um, uh, combat engineers, they needed to, to, to cut lanes through these fortified districts, uh, which the tanks could then advance through. And the only, only division, the tank division, which even crossed the frontier, if I, with Army Group South, if I recall correctly, was the 11th, which actually, I guess, hit a seam or, or just an, an area that wasn't well defended, and I think was able to to advance about 25 kilometers. And, and in, my, in my first day on the Eastern Front, I have this great 
anecdote of a German soldier. Of course, the Russians were initially in a state of shock. And this German soldier, who I think he was with the 11th Panzer, he somehow got separated. And he's, he's walking through these big corn fields and so forth. And he keeps coming across shocked Russian soldiers. And he keeps telling them, you're my prisoner. They throw down his weapons. He ends up walking back to the German lines all by himself with 40 Russian prisoners. Wow. And then, and, and of course, in, in the far south, opposite Romania, all the Germans did on the 22nd of June was um, uh, uh, try to uh, capture uh, a few uh, bridgeheads across the Prut, Prut, or Prut River, however you pronounce it, right on the border there. And they did not begin to attack until the 1st or 2nd of July. And I think that's also an outcome of the Balkan campaign because they just weren't quite ready on the 22nd of June. All right. Now let's, uh, let's just go. Oh, to oh. And, and yeah. I'm sorry, Jim, one more very important point. All of the Stuk, most all of the Stukas or all of them, and there were 323 that were with Army Group Center, and then about 40 were up in Lapland or something in the far north, like with the German Army of Norway. They, the vast majority of them were attached to uh, Richthofen's 8th Air Corps, wow. which, which supported Hoth's 3 Panzer Group. Wow. Right, now let's, uh, let's just... Uh, probably we can finish today with this. So this is a map showing the advances on the 22nd of June. I showed you previously the deployment of troops before the assault. So let's start start with Army Group North. What do you might here's the 291st Infantry Division going along the, the coast here. Uh, here's the 8th Panzer coming through and breaking through, penetrating the lines here. So uh, why don't you just give your analysis this is the first day of fighting on Army Group North. Okay, do you want me to go through all 120 divisions, Jim? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> we okay. will, will eventually do that, Craig. Not yet, baby. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Put a, put up a tent and uh, have someone <laughs> airlift some food to you. Um, right. Okay, uh, it's interesting. I will start, however, with the 291st, which advanced like, I don't know, almost 100 kilometers right along the coast on the very first day. It just hit, hit a seam. There was nothing there. Um, to its immediate right, there was some really, really, I just, I can't think of the name of the city right now, and I can't really see it, but there was some really heavy fighting right on the border there. But the 291st hit a seam and just advanced right along the coast, 80, 90, 100 kilometers, whatever it was. Um, uh, Reinhardt's uh, uh, 41st Panzer Group, kind of in the center, made some good progress, and in the coming days would fight a, a, a serious tank battle with uh, um, Soviet mechanized forces. And then, as I mentioned, farther toward the right, uh, the 8th Panzer Division of Manstein's 56 Panzer Corps uh, was able to capture that viaduct across that key river. And uh, he was a very capable guy, apparently. And they were able to hold it until the rest of the uh, forces came up. So it was uh, it was a pretty successful day for um, uh, Army Group North. Which was the viaduct? This uh, uh, this the object. 11th Panzer? Up, the eight by, up by where eight, eight Panzer is and that, that river, the D-U-B-Y-S-S-A or something like that. Gotcha. So either of these two points there, I guess maybe this is the point you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. That looks like the furthest penetration. Now let's look. Now here we have some significant advance here. Here's the northern part of uh, Army Group uh, Center. Yes, yes. The... Um, uh, Hoth's uh, Panzer Group. Let me see if I can I can pull this out of my head. I I've been so involved in the war in Ukraine the last couple of years, 
I haven't paid any attention to this. Um, but Haas Panzer Group did make a significant penetration uh, as far as the, um, what is it, the, the, the Neiman River there, 50, 60 kilometers. There was a, um, the, the, the advanced detachment of the 6th Infantry Division, which um, made, made it all the way to, to the, to the uh, river as well. And I think was just about to capture bridge bridgehead over it when the uh, the Russians blew it up. And yes, I think it, it was the Seventh Panzer Division, a a battalion under I think it was Rothenberg or Rothenberg was his name, uh, uh, captured a, a a a bridgehead over the Neiman River. And here's the funny thing: tells you a little bit how the Russians fought, and. They, they were able to capture that that bridge, very important bridge, I believe sometime in the afternoon. And there had been, the, the Russians, of course, their sappers had prepared it for demolition. And there was a Russian Red Army dude sitting there ready to, to press down on the plunger and blow it up, but he never did. And when the Germans got across the bridge and captured him and asked him why he didn't blow it up, he said, well, it's because you got here at one o'clock and I wasn't supposed to blow. I had orders to blow up the bridge at three. <laughs> yeah, that that is no, that is no joke. Wow. And it looks like we have another pretty deep breakthrough here uh, by the 18th motorized backed up by the 12th Panzer over here near Vorovnovo or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, I, I can't really speak speak to that one. I will say from, from uh, the very first day of the campaign, the very opening hours, the Germans, I mean, there were some Ru Russian units which, that would gave, which gave up en masse, right? And, and many of those, I think, were Russian units that had been formed from men from the west, western part of the Ukraine that had been taken over by the Russians when they took over eastern Poland and pressed into service with the Red Army. So they weren't too happy about that. And some of them gave up. But more often than not, from the very beginning, after just recovering from the shock, they fought back with an intensity that just flummoxed the Germans. Right. And, and from the very start, you right. hear about Russian sharpshooters mm -hmm. and the toll that they are taking you know, picking off individual soldiers, picking off uh, 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 staff riders or, you know, people carrying messengers on motorcycles, that sort of thing. And, and uh, you see comments in letters written home from the very start of the war. Geez, um, Broomhilda, uh, we're not in France anymore. <laughs> you know, this is a, this is a totally different, uh, a totally different situation. And then, of course, the war crimes. Um, it, it is, you know, the Germans committed horrible war crimes, okay? We all know that. And, and it's not, but it's not true that the Russians only started uh, re reciprocating, you know, killing prisoners and so forth uh, after they figured out what the Germans were doing. Because from the very opening hours of the campaign, a German reconnaissance patrol, for example, that pushed too far ahead, uh, led by an, an overambitious sergeant or something, gets cut off, captured by the Russians, uh, and, and they end up with their all their extremities hacked off, their nose, their ears, their genitals. This sort of thing happened repeatedly from the very opening hours of the campaign. Hmm. Now, I'm looking here at the Ninth Army front this two core, it looks like they rolled back the Russians 15, 20 kilometers here. Yeah, they, they did. There were, uh, I think in, you know, I go, I go through in first day on the Eastern front, I go through it army by army, panzer group by panzer group. And I end up pointing out, you know, how far their spearheads made it on the first day. And yeah, it, 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 a 20, 30 kilometer advance from most of the core was, was pretty common. 
some of course um, made it uh, made it farther. And I see you're getting into uh, in, into the sector of um, Guderian. Of, of Guderian. And, and above him, of course, was um, was uh, who was it? Um, Luga, right? Yeah, his fourth army. And then there's another. Uh, just uh, go go up a little bit, or down down a little bit. And there's also the twenty uh, fourth Panzer Corps under Schweppenberg, which was on the other side. They're they're each on yeah. one side of the of the town of Brest. Uh, here the 24th yeah yeah there it is the 17th panzer division and 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 the 18th that is um uh uh that's well that's uh they're both they're both part of of, of guderian's two panzer group but uh they have different uh different commanders uh the third and fourth were a part of one panzer corps and the 17th and 18th Part of another. The third and fourth were were commanded by by Schweppenberg, and the seventeenth and eighteenth by uh, von Lemelson. And and the eighteenth Panzer Division advanced quite a way un, under General um, General Nering, uh, who's by the way his son, uh, who unfortunately became ill and and took his life back in. 2016. He he wrote the foreword for my book uh, Barbarossa Unleashed. But his oh. father's 18th Panzer Division, which Guderian spent a lot of time on the 22nd of June, um, he he hooked up with it and traveled with it. But it, it saw some combat with uh, Soviet mechanized forces and advanced uh, quite a, a distance. I don't remember exactly how far, but but maybe 40 or, or 50 kilometers. And, and I should also point out the German Luftwaffe also destroyed, hit and destroyed the headquarters of the Soviet Fourth Army. I don't think they killed the, don't recall they killed the commander, but they took out, um, took out its, uh, took out its headquarters. Mm -hmm. and, and Guderian, of course, was advancing his first objective was Minsk, about 300 kilometers away as the crow flies. And in the final conference uh, at the Reich's Chancellery on the 14th of June, the final big conference before the start of Barbarossa, he was asked, how long do you think it will take you to get to Minsk? And I believe he said six days. And he actually got there on the seventh day, I think, his spearheads. Uh, entered the city from the south, and and Hoth's uh, spearheads uh, encircled it uh, to the north. All right, and let's look at uh, any other comments uh, before we hit Army Group South. Oh, oh yes, real quick, um, the fighting for the fortress of Brest Litovsk. Yeah, you know, you want to have any idea how tough this Eastern campaign was going to be? The, it was the German. 45th Infantry Division, which actually was largely uh, of, of the, the rank and file were, were, were mostly Austrian, but I think it had mostly German commanders. Because during the battle for France, it had captured an important fortress over the Aisne River, I believe. It was earmarked to capture the fortress of Brest-Litovsk, okay? And, and they needed to, to, to at least neutralize it to, to clear up the, the, the lines of communication uh, uh, for, for uh, Guderian's panzer group. Um, so they needed to take it out and to clear up the, the, the Panzerstrasse that, that his tanks were going to advance along primarily. Uh, well, the 45th Infantry Division attacked, of course, early in the morning, but the, the bombardment, those Nebelwerfer, you saw those rockets firing at the start of the campaign uh, in the video. That could have very easily been opposite Bresk Latosk because mm. they had a, a um, naval Werfer regiment that mm. literally launched 2,880 missiles wow. in like half an hour or so at the fortress. Mm. But 
the, and of course they had they had a couple of uh, 600 millimeter uh, rail guns that you know had to be translated transported by railroad. Adora and I forget the name of the other one uh, who fired. They only I think they each only managed to fire a few shells and they had mechanical breakdowns. But they had all kinds of artillery uh, firing on that fortress. But the commander of the 45th Infantry, uh, I think his name was Schlieper, he still did not think the artillery program was robust enough and figured that the primary effect would simply be psychological and not material. And he was probably right because the attack looked like it was going well. It's very well documented in the records until about uh, seven, eight in the morning. And then the Soviet res Red Army resistance there began to radically stiffen. The long and short of it is by late afternoon, the Germans had to pull back all their forces in the fortress, except for 60 men who were cut off in a church. They had to pull them back and just, just put them in a ring around the fortress because they weren't making uh, any progress. They lost on that day probably more men, I would gather, than any other division on the Eastern Front. They mm. lost 311 men, mm. including, I believe, 20 officers dead. Mm. Interesting. Uh, that would probably be good for a module of, of that, uh, Alex, the, the Battle of Brest-Litovsk. Uh, any more comments about, uh, here we have, I guess this six down here is this commanded by this is not commanded by Paulus at the time this is commanded sixth, by sixth sixth army is um um Reichenau. that was on I, the left wing of army group south like um who was a real gung-ho nazi if i recall yes yes and, and ended up dying of a stroke i i believe in in in, in around december of 1941 and sixth army is part of army group south i can see yes sir okay so what comments do you want to make good to close out this about the progress sure. well it 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 had to break through these these russian uh the, these these fortress areas and these tremendous fortifications that uh the russians had built in the south and so and, and so a, a, a lot of, a half dozen infantry divisions um, that should have belonged, I think, to what? Um, I think to Stupnagel's uh, 17th Army. Um, a lot of infantry, uh, or there's one other unit there I'm not thinking of, um, but a, a half dozen infantry divisions were temporarily attached to his first panzer group to conduct, it was, so he had control over them to, to make the breakthrough through these uh, Russian defenses, which, which of course they, they succeeded in doing. And, and the, the German tanks, I think, uh, again, except for the 11th Panzer Division, which must have hit a seam. And you can see it sort of peeking through right in the middle of your screen right there, 11 uh, PZ. Uh, but the other, none of the other Panzer Divisions that I know of crossed the border on on that day oh okay and here we and, have and i will say also the the 49th uh gebirgs corps or mountain corps uh uh who the hell is the commander of that uh i can't think of his name right now but he um one of his units was the first mountain division the first mountain division was commanded by general hubert lanz yeah you've got it right there and mountain divisions only had two, two infantry regiments instead of three that you would see in a typical huh. infantry division. So when an infantry division attacked in a situation like this, it would normally attack with two regiments up and one regiment in reserve. Well, he only had two regiments to begin with, so he had to commit them both in the initial attack. Well, in April of 41, he had gone to the commander of um, 49, 
uh, um, Mountain Corps and explained to him, dude, you know, my division is not made to do, it's a mountain division. It's not made for the kind of mission that one of our infantry divisions is made for. And he requested that it be pulled out of the first wave of the attack. Of course, that request was denied and his division, and I have a great account of this because uh, Lons wrote his memoirs after the war. He wrote uh, um, interesting, uh, another interesting book. And my first father-in-law, Dr. Charles Burdick, wrote a biography of General Lons, which came out in 1982, ironically, the year that he passed away. Unfortunately, the book is only available from Biblio Verlag in German, but his activities are well documented that day. And they ran into an absolute stone wall. They wow. hit a village that had been very, very strong, built into a, an practically an impregnable fortress by the Red Army forces there. And they had horrific hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Germans had to bring up flamethrowers. And there's this incredible photograph I have that's in, in, in the book of, um, I'm just pointing that out. I'm not trying to get you to buy it. Um, <laughs> where, where he is standing over, he's inside a trench, a deep trench that the locals had built and placed like one after the other in a row, 13 or 14 bodies all face up of German troops from one of his regiments, either the 98th or 99th, I don't remember which one, which had been killed in that opening combat. And Lons is inside the trench, looking down at them, honoring, going from man to man, apparently, honoring each one of them. It, it's, an, it's, it's just an amazing photograph. And Lons, by the way, had been in slightly injured I think when an artil a artillery fragment grazed his head and he was losing a lot of blood. So shortly after that picture was taken, he collapsed. Hmm. He was taken to uh, a dressing station, fixed up and back at the front in an hour. Wow. And, wow. and his commanders, his commanders got together with him after the day was over and they'd suffered such heavy losses. And, and their collective thinking was, my God, what if it goes on like this? Mm. What are we going to do? Mm. So that's something that people need to remember. The Germans, what they did in the opening phases of the campaign, the first three or four months, 500,000 square miles miles of territory, whatever they took over. It was absolutely extraordinary when you think about it. They, because they faced bitter resistance from the very beginning. And what saved them is the fact that they were experienced. They had good equipment. They were exceedingly well-trained. They had lower level officers and NCOs who, who acted decisively and independently and on the other hand you had russians who were still in the middle of an equipment changeover who weren't well trained and would sit there and not blow up a bridge even though it was being captured because the time hadn't come for them to blow up the bridge yeah very good uh and then of course we have the front further south uh that uh is of course, familiar to us now with the war in Ukraine. Yeah. There, of course, are Romanian troops down to the uh, Black Sea. Um, and we will obviously get into that in greater detail. And I want to just add here, when we're talking about this particular area of the Ukraine, uh, it might, uh, there's a biographer of Stefan Bandera, who teaches at the Free University of Berlin. And What's interesting about the Vol Volhynia area here of uh, um, Poland, uh, the Soviet Union, et cetera, 
we're all familiar with the civil war that occurred there uh, between Poles and Ukrainians during the 20s and 30s. But here is where Bandera comes into play because he will launch a pogrom, uh, I believe, before the Germans actually reach uh, the city of Lemberg, I think I forget if it's in Lemberg or further in there, but but it but it allows us to get a sense of here is where it'd be interesting to bring in this issue of uh, Bandera and all the other uh, baggage that goes with that in our present day, because of course one of the characterizations made politically about the Ukrainians is up oh, they're all a bunch of Banderistas, and so uh, I will track down that historian at Free University of Berlin and get him into the mix at some point. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds good. And I think you're right. It was what the Germans called Lemberg. It's now then Lvov. It's now Lviv. Right. And it was a huge, before the, the NKVD had a prison or two there, and before they pulled out, they slaughtered in the most bestial fashion, I don't know, several thousand prisoners and just right. left them there. And they were found by the Germans. Right. And that led to the... Uh, that triggered the pogrom and of course someone like bandera had openly aligned himself with uh national socialism early on so back in the 30s yes. and actually i think he was even uh praying favor with mussolini because mussolini's intelligence services in the late 20s were quite active in uh supplying support for all sorts of different uh, uh political groups in uh in terms of fascism in europe uh Anybody else have any comments about any of this stuff? Mark. Mark? Oh, Mark. Mark's all... Oh, go on, Mark. Yeah, I had a question going uh, a, a bit back, uh, That a comment that Craig had mentioned, that the, when the, in regards to the Japanese, that they had looked at the Germans going 15 to 20 kilometers uh, per day, then there's the Battle of uh, Smolensk, and then they're going down to four kilometers a day, and that the Japanese had decided... Or concluded, eh, this is the, the the Germans are stalling. My question is, where could the Japanese have got obtained that information? Very specific from information. I I I don't know. I, I presumably the Germans, but I can't imagine the Germans saying, "Hey, we're not doing so well now." I, I just don't see them doing that. So, where did the Japanese get that information? Well, they had liaisons at the front for one thing. Ah, and, and there's a there's a very interesting story. I think sometime in, in late July, early August of one of these Japanese liaisons, I think visiting, I think, I don't remember if it was von Kluge or von Bach, but he, he visits one of the main German commanders in, uh, in, um, on the central front and watches them as, as they are conducting, an, German forces are conducting an attack across the Dnieper River or something. But yeah, they clearly had uh, you know, their, uh, their liaisons and 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 uh, who is their their military attaché or whatever back in Oshima or something. Yeah, Oshima. And I'm sure they were we we're getting regular reports on 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 what was <clears throat> going on. And I think even we, uh, you know, the American intelligence. And I think uh, Jim had mentioned this earlier. Our when the war started, our view was pretty much the same as. Paulus's was when he went in and told von Baralkic, oh yeah, we'll be done in eight to 10 weeks. We felt exactly the same thing, that the Russians wouldn't wouldn't uh, be able to withstand a German invasion any longer than that. Um, and, and, but, we, but, but we also became aware when, when it started to slow down uh, at Smolensk. And, and my view, which I think is a view of, of David Stahl also, is that's when the campaign was lost because that's when the momentum of the blitzkrieg was dramatically slowed and and the russians had made it, uh, the red army had survived intact and and were launching serious counteroffensives which was one of the reasons uh, one was called the timoshenko offensive from late uh, from i think actually early july uh, all the way through like the second week of September on the second front, they were launching massive counterstrokes, and and they may have been uncoordinated. The troops may have have not been well trained. The equipment may have sucked, at least in part. 
but they attrited the German forces. And these forces weren't being given many replacements, certainly virtually nothing when it came um, to, their, to their armor. So, so uh, and, and of course, the Soviet state hadn't collapsed. And, and this is one point th that I make, and I should probably trademark this because I don't know that I'm the greatest independent thinker, but uh, this was kind of a thought that occurred to me that I think is, is a pretty good way of looking at it. The German attack on the 22nd of June, 1941, was kind of the early 1940s equivalent of a nuclear first strike. It was the largest invasion force the world had ever seen, and it was supposed to just defeat the Russians in this massive initial hammer blow from which they would never recover. And it failed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go on, Alex. Yeah, Craig, it's going to have you here. Um, yeah, again, I was, yeah, I've been going through, you know, since we've been preparing for this, um, you know, a lot of, da yeah, David Stahill's books, you know, I haven't gone right. through all of them. I got to get the book on um, on um, Battle of Moscow and, yeah, and um, I, I also just got his new book on uh, Panzer Generals, which right. I mean, that four of them, <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, one of the things that I got, especially from his his first book, which is based on his dissertation, for like the initial attack of Barbarossa, is uh, some of the personality conflicts between the German generals, especially between um, this real feud that seems to develop between von Bach and Guderian, where again, at certain points, Guderian literally disobeys orders and gets mm -hmm. away with it, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, so I wonder if you just talk about that, like, yeah, the, the role of like yeah, the generals kind of fighting amongst each other and you know feuding, um, disagreeing, but you know even yeah, disobeying orders from superiors because I found that really interesting and yeah. obviously disruptive but, to well the uh, generals operation. like like generals everywhere were prima donnas okay, and I think the feud you're you're referring to is the one between the fourth army commander von Kluge and Guderian. They yeah, yeah, but also hated, von Bach, I got a little bit. Yeah, they hated, hated each together. other's guts. There's no other way of putting it. Uh, von Kluge thought that Guderian was just kind of a, a, a um, <clears throat> you know, a wild man. He was just gonna rush off with his tanks and get, get them in all sorts of trouble. And he just need to be reined in and held back. And Guderian thought that Kluge just didn't, he was an army general that didn't have an effing clue about how panzer warfare is, is, is raised. But yeah, Guderian, he, at, at early in the campaign, even Hitler got cold feet like he did in France. So to try and kind of rein in Hoth and Guderian a bit, he, he took Kluge's headquarters and put it in charge as the fourth panzer army put it in charge of both guderian and hoth and 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 the infant the infantry was turned over to maximilian von weiss's second army okay and at one point so, so this was supposed by putting him the german high command and hitler thought by putting these two rash panzer generals under Kluge, that, that would hold them in check somewhat. But they quickly got frustrated with von Kluge because basically the panzer forces were spread out over hundreds of kilometers of territory. And at one point, I think it was von Bach who said to Kluge sometime, I think in late July or something, damn it, make a fist somewhere. You know, make a Schwerpunkt, concentrate your forces. And then of course, and in, in, when the retreat started, Guderian, I don't know if he panicked or what, but I think by this point, you know, these weren't young men. And I think he was probably out, totally out of gas and utterly worn out physically and psychically, psychologically. And he kept pulling back, I think toward the, like the Oka River line when he'd been told repeatedly to stand his ground. And so finally on, 
either Christmas Day or the day after, um, a von Kluge, it must have been with great schadenfreude because he'd just taken over a week ago as commander of Army Group Center. He cashiered Guderian, and Guderian never had another field command in the rest of the war. Hmm. All right, and just to let you guys know, I put up in the chat uh, volume four of the uh, Germany and the Second World War series, a PDF of that. And that is the uh, German official history of the Second World War. Now, I'm not saying this is it's not like reading uh, Tom Wolf. It's, <laughs> it's not like it's not like reading uh, uh, Electric. What, what what some other great? Uh, uh, I actually used to see him in a gym on the Upper East Side yeah. uh, in his in his dotage. Um, but in any event, that's considered one of the better books in the past thirty years on this subject of the invasion of the Soviet Union. And it's about a thousand page book, so you can download it. Uh, and it's in a PDF format. Uh, hopefully it won't pollute your computer, but nevertheless, uh, does anybody else have any comments or questions that hasn't, and it hasn't said anything at this point? Thanks yep. again. Thanks Thank again. You guys. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Ted. Uh, Thank everyone. you so much. Enjoyed Great it. job. Yeah, we should also tell, really tell Ted um, have a good trip to Japan. Since oh, good. thank you. Yeah, a good dinner day after tomorrow. I'm on my way. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh -huh. All thank right. Have fun in Kyoto. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Craig, I'm going to start Kyoto. Yeah. Craig, right. you did a good awesome. job. Great Thanks. job. Thanks. Wonderful Thanks. job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks again, Bye. Dave. Bye. Guys. Bye. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Bye bye. Bye bye.